Paula, your daughter, you cute Chloe. How is she dealing with this? How are you explaining to her what's going on, you know, with this world right now? So what we're trying to do here at home is to indicate to her, look, there's some difficult things happening in the world. And because of that, we're going to keep you safe at home. And, you know, explaining the science a little bit. She became very interested in the coronavirus. So she did a 3D um, kind of version of it. And she developed a microscope oh, wow. out of cardboard. You know, I think she's starting to feel the isolation. She misses school. You know, children really like routine in general. It appears that they don't, but they really do. Who are you working with now mostly? What people come uh, to you for? You know, with what issues? Tremendous sense of fear about the future, anxiety, isolation, lots of concerns about financial issues. What's gonna happen? How are we gonna cope with this? Is it ever gonna be back to normal? Everyone knew that they had to kind of stay at home for a little bit, then it got extended. Right. We're hearing more news about how, you know, the, the, the numbers of, of people who are not doing well, et cetera. So I think it's almost like a, like gradually the trauma is setting in, the stress is setting in. There was a news report today, this morning, that the level, the, there's a huge number of increased uh, levels of domestic violence. Right. So right. that means the calls that are coming in for issues of violence within the home are increasing and that unfortunately makes sense. It's really the desperation of what's happening and what's to come because no one really knows. Um, you know, and the news are really, really traumatizing for people. So I think that's something else that we're all kind of dealing with. I live uh, 10 miles north of Manhattan are on the border of New Jersey, the state of New Jersey, and the state of New York. So here, we are told that this is an epicenter, that we have been hit very hard, there are many cases, we've been told. Now, I have made it a point to go around to all the hospitals in my county, as well as in New York State, it's called Rockland County, I've gone to the hospitals there. And what I see from the outside, I emphasize from the outside, is I see a very calm picture. I've never seen these hospitals so quiet, such a lack of activity, I've never seen it like this before. Usually there's a lot of sirens and police and people coming and going. But now what's happening is that people are afraid to go to the hospital. They're staying away from the hospital. Yes, even for minor issues, even for usual issues that they would go to the hospital with, they're staying away. I've personally tried to contact some doctors and they always refuse to speak, which I find very unusual. Now, I have reached, I have contacted one friend who is a director of a hospital in the Bronx in New York City. And he said, he says this, he says, yes, we have a lot of patients, but it is manageable. The number of patients is manageable. It's not a war zone. It's not a war zone with mass chaos and people dying on the streets and people falling over because of infection. That is not true. But who is saying that it is like this? The, the mainstream media. Do you know any cases where, like, proven cases that mass media lied about uh, the situation, exaggerated the situation? Well, there's, yeah, there's um, Dr. Colleen Smith. She, her video has gone viral. It was on the New York Times. She was saying that they don't have enough equipment. Oh, there's, it's, it's a war zone. It's been overwhelmed. And even the hospital she works for, you know, they've disavowed her statements. This is so reckless. To say something is a war zone, people have to think about the power of their words. But when you start saying it's a war zone, that creates such an atmosphere of fear and hysteria. So the major media is working with their experts. And I know how it's done because I've been in the major media. You pick your experts who are going to say what you want to hear. And then you create a narrative. And then you put that narrative out there on many different media outlets and you create hysteria, you create a false narrative, you create a highly distorted version of reality. We don't have enough information. People today in America, and I speak to a lot of different people, they keep saying the same thing. We feel that the information is controlled, we feel that we're not getting enough information. Look what the YouTube has. How is YouTube fighting misinformation around coronavirus? Uh, and they say that they are going to continue to quickly remove videos that violate 
their policies. So basically what they're saying, if something doesn't fall under official narrative, they're going to delete these videos. I have a friend, uh, he's a German independent journalist, and he went to uh, hospitals in Berlin. And then he reported him saying that hospitals are basically empty. There is no crowds, no uh, ambulances, you know, rushing uh, from and to the hospitals. Uh, he put this video on YouTube and this video um, got blocked. Yeah. straight away there's been a lot of censorship and that of course raises the question okay you people if you're so confident that your narrative is truthful what are you afraid of why are you censoring different viewpoints if you have the truth on your side why do you need censorship there are experts from stanford university from major institutions major medical professors and doctors who are saying wait stop we ha let's have a discussion the data let's look at the data let's look at this more soberly. Let's look at this more carefully. And those experts are not getting time on major TV stations. It's been tough, but I'm just not going out at this point. There's a lot of cases and I'm trying to uphold to the stay at home order that the White House has said that we have to stay at home till the end of April. My normal environment, if I don't turn the TV on and see the death toll, or if I don't read the news on the internet, my normal day continues along. But the fact is that for most people, it is depressing, it is unsettling. A lot of people in New York are in tight quarters. And, and some people have several people on top of them. I mean, they have, in order to afford to live in the city, it's very expensive, they have multiple roommates. I don't know how people are coping even at this point. But say this goes on another 60 days, that would, that would not be good, I don't think, for people's emotional state a mental state, not only that, financially. I saw yesterday a post on Facebook, you say that you can get a food delivery in New York City for one week. Yes, I've gone on Amazon, I've gone on Whole Foods on Amazon, I've gone on Instacart, I've gone on Fresh Direct, Food Emporium, there's a lot of different places and they're all the slots are full. So obviously we can still go out for essential goods. Unfortunately, I really don't want to go out unless I have to. So I have food, but I know in a couple of days I'm going to need food. So I'm trying to get ahead of it to, because to schedule the delivery, even if you get a slot, you don't get it right the same day. Where in New York before, you could order food and get it in an hour. <laughs> I mean, that's literally like what New York City is like, which is so convenient living here. But right now, 10 million people in their homes, 10 million people stuck in their homes in the city and all the delivery stops are full. So they want us to stay indoors. But I think part of it is that a lot of the delivery people are not coming to work. They, they, they are, they're scared and they really have had a lot of people that have quit. I'm surprised the market, the stock market didn't react more aggressively to the downside once they announced the 30 days extension to the end of April, but they had already pushed schools off into April. So I felt confident we were gonna be at home way past the initial 15 day period. I don't think what has happened to date is tragic for the market, even though we're far off the highs, we could recover quickly. The problem is for 2020, I really don't think we will recover quickly because this is not an economic situation this is not an economic problem, but it's becoming an economic problem. In other words, the problem really is the virus. If we get back to normal in, I'd say, probably early summer, I think we're going we're gonna to be able to come through this, and most people will come through this, including the businesses with the stimulus package. But if it drags on deep into the summer months of 2020, and worst case scenario, into the end of the summer 2020, then I think it's going to be really, really problematic. That's where I see that the economy can drastically suffer because we just had a huge, huge unemployment number where the number of people filing for unemployment in the last two weeks just skyrocketed here in the United States. So what you don't wanna see that follow through into the third quarter of, of 2020. As a psychologist who has done this work for, you know, I guess 20 years now, almost 20 years, um, I do find myself feeling rather stressed about what to do. My fear is if I end up having suicidal patients, if I end up having people who really need urgent care, where do I send them? The chances are that the situation is only going to get more serious, right? In terms of the mental health crisis that I think the world will, will experience. So from my perspective is, well, Eventually, I am going to have suicidal patients. I'm going to have people who are going to tell me, I am going to kill myself. 
And my concern is what resources will I have at that point in time? Since I am not able to, I cannot do home visits. It's not something we traditionally do anyway. I'm not able to see someone in person to have a better sense. I do not know what hospitals will be able to see my patients. Um, I don't know if, if a 911 call, which is what I would do, will respond to a case about someone who may you know, be threatening to hurt him or his, herself. So th that's what I worry about. My father just finished a round of chemo. So because I have this, this very, very high vulnerability person in my family, that increases my personal level of anxiety. There was a news report recently in which one of the governors said, at this point in time, if someone has a heart attack, and you call the emergency line, we come to your house. If the person's dead already, we will not do the usual procedure, which is to take the person to the hospital to resuscitate. That's not happening anymore. And that is the usual procedure. Why? Because hospitals don't have the ability to respond to that unlikely chance that the person will come, you know, will, will make it. So my father's the one who called me and said, look, I, you know, I don't know what's going to happen. I am working with several hospital workers. And so that's a very different level of impact. And I can tell you, it's really already what I would consider in the traumatizing, in the trauma category. Many, many issues within a session that all surround, you know, lack of resources and how to cope. I'm literally talking to a physician who left the hospital at midnight and wants to call me to ask me what to do tomorrow so that he can cope with the panic attacks or that he can, you know, just be okay when he's home so his children are not afraid or something because he's so anxious. I would literally have someone who's walking at home from the hospital. So I can't really see the person. I can hardly hear things. So it's very challenging. You know, it's really all that we, we, we use, whatever resources we have. It's a bit like in war times, right? You worked as an NGO director for five years in Russia, right? Yes. Uh, you were dealing with homeless people um, who were, for most of the part, they're sick. Uh, they have different infectious diseases. Almost every day for five years, I dealt with these people who had terrible infectious diseases. We had no mask, no gloves, because there were none in Russia. This was the early 1990s, when the country had literally collapsed. And the biggest danger was antibiotic resistance tuberculosis. Now that's a bacteria, it's not a virus, but it's extremely dangerous, extremely infectious, and many people were dying from it in Russia in the 1990s, and it still is a threat. It kills 1.5 million people every year. But we have no national, we have no international emergency, no international lockdown. What? Those 1.5 million people, their lives don't count? Just check the numbers. The first case of COVID-19 was diagnosed on January 21st, 2020. Now, two and a half months have passed. And according to the official data, 6,000 Americans have died from COVID-19. Now, let's think about that. That is 1% of the total deaths in those past two and a half months. In those past two and a half months, according to John Hopkins University, medical malpractice kills about 50,000 people. That's mistakes by doctors, nurses, and other hospital administrators. But let's put this into perspective. Why are other problems not so important? Uh, are you saying that lockdown was not necessary? Well, Absolutely. What's your stand on Let's go this? back to 1918, the height of the Spanish flu, the influenza pandemic. New York City did not lock down. New York City did not shut down like today. And that was a really a terrible pandemic with lots of people dying. What did New York City do 100 years ago? They uh, simply quarantined. Anyone who showed symptoms, they were quickly quarantined. And so they acted very quickly to quarantine those who were sick but they didn't shut down the city. So why are we doing it today? Why don't we just quarantine those who are sick plus those who are vulnerable? Let's continue with life. A number of people who are going to die from the economic depression is going to be many, many more 
than from this virus. Trust me. And I'm talking about not just a matter of months, I'm talking years. I strongly believe that it was necessary. I really do. Even with a lockdown, I believe that, I, forgive me if, if I'm misquoting the numbers, but I think I just read this morning that in two days there were in two days, there were a thousand people who died in New York City or in New York State, all of New York. So even so, imagine if we hadn't had the, the lockdown. So that's kind of what I'm thinking. Without it, people would just become infected. I mean, it would be mass infection and, a, and even more of an inability to really respond to it. What we're going through today is the world is going through it. I think it really adds a different layer. For some reason, I think the biggest problem about uh, the coronavirus is it seems to be very, very easy to catch. So in that sense, unlike the flu, which yes, obviously people get the flu during flu seasons. I didn't realize how many people till recently have died from the flu every year. They really don't have all the details to share with us about I think how the virus is infecting other people. I mean, one person was saying, if you breathe in the air, if you touch a cardboard box delivery from Amazon, I don't really honestly think they have all the answers. So fortunately, it is something that is a global pandemic. It's not just United States. It's not just New York. And it's affecting economies all over the world. I have two disparate opinions about this. Okay, let's assume that the government is correct. Maybe, maybe this virus is really something so terrible Maybe it was genetically engineered, and maybe they know that, and more and more experts are starting to say that perhaps this escapes from a lab. Okay, so maybe they are correct. Now, the other uh, idea that I have on the other side is that, okay, it's a virus, but it's being greatly exaggerated because this is a power struggle. This is a power struggle for control of the White House, for the control of the American economy, and control of the global economy. Where the truth is, I mean, I don't know. Nobody really knows. Can we try and find something positive in this, John? Is it possible? <laughs> Let me think. Well, real estate is going to be very cheap soon. So if you have some money, no, oh, okay. <laughs> if you have some money in the bank, just wait. The real estate market is crashing. Maybe you can get, you know, soon you can buy an, an apartment in Manhattan for probably five thousand bucks or something. <laughs> oh wow! I'm coming to New York then. Right now they're doing no showings. No showings in New York for real estate at all, not for renting, not for buying. That is going to continue this whole month, so you know prices are going to drop. Well, I think there's going to be opportunity in the stock market to buy individual stocks for people to do investing, for long-term investing, for maybe their retirement accounts, or even for short-term investing, because they're going to be able to pick up some stocks at really cheap prices, whether that's active trading or long-term investing. Not right now, because I still think the market's lower, but for people who have never entered the market, particularly, I'm talking about young people, 20s, 30s, 40s, even early 50s. If people never started a, a any kind of 401k, they're gonna have an opportunity to begin investing in the market at much lower prices than they would have when the market was at the highs in 2019. So I teach people how to trade the stock market with their own money. Like if you wanted to come and learn from me, my class is on a weekend outside market hours, and then you would learn how to invest in the market yourself and make money. And to be honest with you, this has been a good year for the stock swoosh and for my clients. Why? We've been shorting. So if you learn how to trade actively, you can short stocks. So stocks have been falling in the last month. And so my traders have been making money betting on the downside, which has turned out to be correct. So I do believe that this selling will continue. So again, it is a good time right now. If uh, after 9-11, we started being afraid of uh, terrorists, of people who can be terrorists among us, won't we find ourselves in a situation when, you know, we were afraid of basically of people? Look, I think it's, it's a good point. Um, because I've experienced that myself. So, you know, when, when I go out with my husband and my daughter for a brief walk, if someone doesn't acknowledge the fact that we're on the same sidewalk, we're kind of like, okay, let's go, let's cross the street. So we have a game about this. It's like people alert and we run. <laughs> <laughs> you see people <laughs> alert. Oh, wow. The person alert, run. So we, we, we literally, you know, cross the street. Yeah. Um, yes, it's the reality. It's what we're going through. I hope that we don't all end up 
completely isolated for years to come and and with increased fears about things i hope that we you know when it feels safer right to come out we will all kind of get together and reunite and be be good with one another is the world going to drastically change In ways that we can't imagine for example authorities are already talking about that you will need a special certificate to prove that you are free of the coronavirus. And without this certificate, you can't get a job, you can't travel. Okay, you don't want to take the test, fine. You sit at home. That is totalitarian. Even with HIV, which was a terrible virus, we never had anything like that. There's gonna be so much social control, so much intervention in our lives. Basically, forget the Constitution. Our constitutional rights, forget it, it's gone. What are you personally lacking in this self-isolation? The issue of reliable information is what's really lacking. We could always um, talk to people before, but now nobody knows anything because everyone's locked in their houses. Nobody really knows what's happening uh, because we, nobody's out. Nobody can see things. We have to trust the media. It's hard to get a real picture of what's really happening. And I think that's what's frightening people. We, we feel like we're sheep and we're being herded. Our American government has been waging war around the world, right? All around the world. We've been waging war. We spent uh, probably ten million, ten trillion dollars on war. Why didn't we? If we had, imagine if we had, if we had spent even ten percent of that ten trillion. Imagine if we had spent it on biodefense, on improving our healthcare system. But no, no one did it. It wasn't done. A lot of Americans are, they say, locked and loaded. Believe me, you know the issue of guns in this country and bio, and civil war. It's a big issue. People are furious, especially when you got to the South and the Midwest. People are furious. They're angry. I've been talking. I've been talking to some of them, and they're angry. So there's um, it's going to get bad. It's, it's going to get much worse, and not because of the virus, yeah. because of the social explosion that's coming. Just think about where you will be a year from now. Come up with a plan for that. Don't focus on today. You know, a lot of people tell you be mindful of the current moment and all of that. Right now, I'm telling people think ahead, plan ahead, because. That's what you have. That's something you can hopefully, plan, you know, capture. You can hopefully go to because you can't really go anywhere else right now. <laughs>